Sunday. Over on BBC Two shortly, a deaf woman begins to hear messages from aliens in a new series of The Outer Limits. The Nine O'Clock News, now on BBC One with Peter Sissons. John Major names the day at last. The people will vote on May the 1st. And within hours, the Prime Minister was back campaigning from his famous soapbox, confident he'd win again. But tonight, the paper that claimed it won it for the Tories last time has switched allegiance to Labour. And no new dumping place in the Lake District. The nuclear waste company Nirex has lost its fight to start tests. Good evening. A full six and a half weeks before polling day, the party leaders are out campaigning in earnest after John Major ended all the speculation and named the day May the 1st. MPs will say goodbye or au revoir to Westminster on Friday. On May the 7th, a new parliament will reassemble. From Westminster, our political editor Robin Oakley. At last, Peter, the phony war is over and the real thing has begun. The nation was launched this morning on the longest election campaign this century, an election which will sorely test the stamina of Britain's politicians and the patience of the people. At 11.30, Mr Major went to the palace to request Parliament's dissolution and to let the Queen in on the not very well kept secret of the election date. Shortly before that, he told the Cabinet. They emerged with varying degrees of gung-ho humour. Mr Major's colleagues, facing the most substantial deficit in the opinion polls which any government has ever taken into an election, insisted they'd win nevertheless, and deserve to. But it was hardly an encouraging omen that a removal van had called in Downing Street this morning, as new brooms prepared the way for the big day. On his return from the palace, a relaxed Prime Minister gave the official news. Good morning. I'd like to formally confirm that I've seen Her Majesty the Queen this morning and sought her permission for a dissolution of Parliament and a general election on the 1st of May. I'm delighted to tell you that Her Majesty has consented to that. Tory governments, he told the massed media, had presided over a revolution in choice, opportunity and living standards, and the parties which had opposed those reforms couldn't be trusted to preserve them. Relieved, perhaps, to be getting his gaff-prone MPs away from Westminster, he was ready for the fight. I'm looking forward to getting out of uh, Whitehall and Westminster and campaigning in every part of the country and taking the message of what we've achieved and of our hopes and ambitions for this country out to people in every part of the United Kingdom. Elections, some people say, are tough and gruelling businesses. Well, up to a point that's true, but I think they're also a lot of fun. The election was winnable, he'd told the Cabinet, and he responded to the suggestion that after 18 years it was time for a change. So if people are looking for change, we are the change, and we'll carry forward what we've been doing for the last 18 years. Thank you all very much. Labour's leader, hoping to swap his Islington home for a rather better known address, is rejecting the argument of his party's lack of experience in government as a call for a one-party state. Against an appropriate backdrop, he was ready to promise a better future for Britain under Labour. This campaign is going to be about the condition of Britain now and the future of Britain, that Britain can be better than this. And it'll be about how the Conservative Party have let people down, have broken their promises, and about how a new and revitalised Labour Party can get this country going. He denies in a Newsnight interview tonight the charge that there's little between the parties. You know, I think there are a lot of priorities that are different between Labour and Conservative, and they're different people with different values. And the idea that, you know, because it's not the old tax and spend uh, left, then therefore we don't offer anything new or different, I think it's just absurd. The Liberal Democrats, hoping to build on their local government advance with more MPs in the next Parliament, rely on targeting seats in regions where they're strong. Their leader, Paddy Ashdown, chides the other parties for ducking the truth on tax. It is between two parties who think that the most important thing for Britain last November's budget was to give us a temporary, and I do mean temporary, penny cut in income tax, 
and one party, the Liberal Democrats, who believes that that money should be invested for the long term in education and in health. There was one useful endorsement for Mr. Major. Embarrassed, perhaps, by stories of complimentary remarks she'd made about Mr. Blair, Lady Thatcher tonight announced her backing for the Prime Minister. I hear people saying, time for a change. That's absurd. If you've got a good builder, or dare I say it, a good grocer, or a good government, you don't change, you stick with them. And I hope you'll stick with us. There's just a few days left at Westminster now before the end of this Parliament. The election battles to come will centre on the economy, on Europe and on the Constitution. But above all, they'll centre on leadership in what promises to be Britain's most presidential election yet. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. The Prime Minister launched the Conservative campaign by immediately taking to the road armed with his soapbox. He began in Luton where he battled with hecklers and promised another Tory victory. The Labour leader Tony Blair began his campaign by heading for a marginal seat in Gloucestershire. However, it won't be until after Easter that the parties will issue their manifestos and it won't be until April the 8th that Parliament will be formally dissolved. The following week, April the 16th, is the last day for candidate nominations. The general election will be held on May the 1st, with local elections in England also held on that day. The following week, the new Parliament reassembles, and the Queen's speech will be on May the 14th. Moments into the campaign, John Major in touch with ordinary people. At least that's the image the Tories are counting on to please the voters, though it isn't easy to get that close even to a Prime Minister who's keen to display a common touch. Out came the famous soapbox. John Major believes he's shown he can confound his critics. He's hoping history will repeat itself this time. The last time I came to Luton, we had a reception just like this. And three weeks later, we won both the Luton seats and the general election. <laughs> this kind of pace won't be easy for any party leader to keep up through the longest campaign in recent times. The Tories are promising as much of this as the members only rallies and the stage managed photo calls. The danger is a long campaign could strain Tory nerves too. Tony Blair's wasting no time either, and his wife Cherie has a prominent part, though it'll mostly be a non-speaking one. This is the beginning of the election, so they tell me. <laughs> the message is meant to reflect the view that most worries the Tories. Mr Blair told these converts to Labour, it's time for a change. I want my kids to do well in their life. I, don't, I want them to go on and be successful. I think everybody does. But I believe that you can have such a society and have it also with some compassion and sense of obligation and decency towards other people. Now, it's as simple as that to me. The Liberal Democrats are hoping to score as the only party offering a real alternative and hard choices, like the opportunity to pay more in tax for schools and health. Even before the two bigger parties published their manifestos, Paddy Ashdown's mocking them as offering the same thing. We've got a great message to put forward. We're the only party now who says we will invest more in education. If your teacher's being sacked, blame the Conservatives, but don't look to Labour for help. They've said they're going to have the same budget as the Conservatives. If your hospital is in crisis, blame the Conservatives. But don't look to Labour for help. They'll actually spend less on the NHS than the Tories will. The Conservatives waited this long to call the election, hoping the economic feel-good factor would have translated by now into support for the Conservatives. It hasn't so far, and now they're counting on the weeks ahead to wear away at Labour's appeal. Many voters have still to make up their minds. But there's an obvious risk. If the Tories fail to make an impact, the passing weeks could easily strain any semblance of unity in the Tory party to breaking point. John Pinar, BBC News, Conservative Central Office. The Sun newspaper, which claims it helped swing victory for the Conservatives five years ago, says it's now backing Tony Blair for number 10. The move's being announced on the front page tomorrow. Our media correspondent Nick Hyam reports. Tomorrow's Sun, in a decision authorised personally by the paper's proprietor, Rupert Murdoch, says Tony Blair is a breath of fresh air and the Tories are tired, divided and rudderless. It's the first time in more than 15 years that Britain's biggest selling daily paper hasn't backed the Conservatives. It's a momentous decision for us today, uh, but we've uh, come to the conclusion that Tony Blair is the man that can possibly lead us into the 21st century. He offers a dy dynamic personality, uh, he's got some new ideas, uh, and frankly, we feel the Tory party are divided and run out of ideas. In 1992, the Sun had no doubt its vocal support for the Tories helped clinch the election, coupled as it was with a sustained campaign against Labour and its leader, Neil Kinnock. He thought so too. The Conservative supporting press 
has enabled the Tory party to win yet again when the Conservative Party could not have secured victory for itself on the basis of its record, its programme or its character. The Sun's owner, Rupert Murdoch, is the world's most powerful media mogul. He believes supporting politicians at election time makes them more likely to do in favours once they're in government. Since 1992, Labour and Mr Murdoch have been building bridges. Tony Blair even travelled to Australia to talk to a gathering of Murdoch executives. Unlike Labour, the Sun's been staunchly anti-Europe. But this morning's paper reported an apparent hardening of Labour's position on Europe, which may have paved the way for tomorrow's declaration of support. There's no real evidence that what newspapers say does affect the way the majority of their readers vote. The Sun's decision is largely symbolic, but it will be a morale booster for Labour. After all, Rupert Murdoch is a man who likes to back winners. Nick Hyam, BBC News. Constitutional reform will be one of the key issues being debated by all the parties over the coming weeks. The Prime Minister said he would expose the perils of the changes proposed by the opposition parties. But the leader applied Comrie, David Wigley, welcomed the opportunity for a national debate. As far as the UK is concerned, Mr Major has said that this is going to be a debate largely about the constitutional issues, in which case the proposals we have need to be put to the electorate in England as well so they can evaluate fully the claims being made by the Prime Minister. And in Scotland too, the question of how it should be governed will be central to the election debate. The leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmond, said the question of constitutional reform should transcend all other issues. Our Scottish political editor, Brian Taylor, reports. In Glasgow, they've been buffing up the ballot boxes for three weeks in readiness for the election. Following the Prime Minister's lead, the Scots Tories are similarly polishing their rhetoric in defence of the Union. We're making sure that Scotland remains a full and equal partner within the United Kingdom. We're not prepared to compromise Scotland's position by a fatally flawed devolution scheme as are all the other parties. As well as Westminster, this election could help fill these seats. The Scottish Parliament in waiting, vacant since Labour's last attempt at devolution in the 1970s. But Labour privately fears the minute detail of home rule deters voters. And so instead they talk up the everyday gains they claim devolution would bring. Our policies on education, on health, on welfare into work and for a Scottish devolved parliament are going to be the policies which we believe will revitalise this whole country and there's no complacency in the Labour camp. Yeah. Scottish nationalist leaders claim Labour is backtracking on home rule. Their hope is that those Scots who are hostile to the Tories and disillusioned with Westminster may jump straight to the option of all-out independence. John Major himself has said the Constitution is the issue which transcends a campaign. He's wanting to fight the election on the SNP's home ground. And on the SNP's home ground, we're going to give him one hell of a beating. Scottish Lib Dems, who have drafted a devolution plan alongside Labour, claim the union is threatened not by them, but by the Tories. I believe it's the Conservative Party's proposals of complete intransigence, inflexibility in the face of considerable body of opinion in Scotland for constitutional change. That's the way to break up the union. Particularly here in Scotland, this election is not simply a question of who governs, but what form that government should take. Labour and the Liberal Democrats say home rule, with Scotland remaining part of the UK, would strengthen the union. The Tories say it would create conflict with England and ultimately break the union. The Nationalists want Scots to make that break at this election. These are the Articles of Union, the treaty which merged Scotland and England 390 years ago. This election, falling exactly on the anniversary of that treaty, will decide whether that union requires to be revised or scrapped altogether. In one of his target seats. The election has been called at a time when Labour have a large lead in the opinion polls. Peter Snow, who will be keeping an eye on the pollsters throughout the campaign, says they're suggesting the lead is now between 18 and 26 per cent. No Prime Minister has ever had to call an election from this far behind in the polls. And no Prime Minister, even half as far behind as Mr Major, has gone on to win. But who believes the polls? Remember how embarrassed we all were on election night last time? As the election results came in five years ago, it was soon clear just how wrong the polls had got it. It's a rotten use for the opinion polls. All the opinion polls that came out yesterday morning have blown it. Which party would you vote for if there were a general election tomorrow? After three weeks of intensive polling and over 50,000 people interviewed, the polls pointed overwhelmingly to a hung parliament. 
On election day, all except one, Gallup, put Labour ahead. And even Gallup was only forecasting a tie. But to the pollster's horror, the Tories ended up nearly 8% ahead. Um, well, it is absolutely, and that's why... I mean, Since then, the pollsters have been scratching their heads at seminars like this recent one at Westminster, debating how to prevent a repeat of what the country's leading election expert says was the Waterloo of the polls, a massive defeat for their credibility. We can't trust them, but we can trust them more than other sources. I shan't believe important informed party circles or all the other inside dopesters or even my taxi driver who tells me what's going to happen in the election. The pollsters have a great stake in getting it right. And I'm phoning on behalf of the Gallup Opinion Poll in London. So the battle is now on to get it right. With Gallup, for example, switching to telephone polling because they believe it'll help them keep their samples more representative and reduce the number of people who don't know or refuse to say how they'll vote. If there was a general election tomorrow, which party would you vote for? Most pollsters believe that those don't knows may include a disproportionate number of Tories, reluctant to admit the way they'll vote, which helped skew the polls in Labour's favour last time. So Gallup and other pollsters adjust their figures to make the best estimate they can of how those shy Tories are going to vote. Part of the problem with the polls was shy Tories. The trouble is that they all make slightly different adjustments to allow for any Labour bias in their raw figures. But all this soul-searching leaves the pollsters deeply divided. There are a number of people who would rather not say how they're going to vote or don't know how they're going to vote, and those are predominantly past Conservative supporters, so that's why we adjust. But another pollster told me that although his professional ego did take a knock in 1992, he won't be adjusting his figures this time to allow for anyone who might be a little shy at admitting they were going to vote Conservative. I don't see much evidence for it. There may be one or two percentage points in it. There might be one or two people in a hundred who might be reluctant to admit that they were going to vote for this party or that party, perhaps the Tory party, uh, because it is unpopular at the moment. Uh, but I, I don't think that that's the way I want to uh, risk my reputation. So can we trust the polls? The record of the last seven elections shows they've tended to overestimate Labour rather than the Tories. In 1970, the polls were 7% out in Labour's favour. The Tories actually won. In the next five elections, there were small errors until the biggest error of all in 1992, a whole 8% in Labour's favour. But compare all that with Labour's lead of around 23% in this month's polls so far on average. Even if that's as far out as the worst so far in 1992, Labour still appear to be comfortably ahead. And the scale of Labour's victory in the Wirral by-election last month broadly echoes the message of the polls, as do results in local council by-elections over the past two months. But until we get the people's real verdict on polling day, we won't be sure whether the polls have won back people's trust or have suffered another, perhaps fatally, damaging upset. You must always assume in polling that the future will resemble the past. Sometimes the damn future comes and hits you in the face and does something different. One thing Labour will be hoping doesn't happen this time is the tendency for support to shift towards the party the polls suggest is the underdog. This does appear to have happened in most recent elections. And if it does happen this time, it can only help the Tories. Well, our political editor, Robin Oakley, joins me now from Downing Street. Presumably, Robin, the rationale behind the six-week campaign is the hope that the polls can be turned round. Well, partly that, yes. Mr Major's hoping for more time for the feel-good factor to take effect uh, as tax cuts come into people's pay packets, as more unemployment figures come out. I think he's also glad to have a long campaign, really, uh, in order to get his own MPs away from Westminster. They proved so indisciplined and so gaff-prone uh, that I think he'd rather have them back in their constituencies for a long time fighting for their own survival. But the main reason why he went for a long campaign was his belief that we in the media have had all our focus on the government and its difficulties and its problems uh, over recent months. And once we get into an election campaign proper, then he feels the focus will switch to the opposition and to their policy and that we will, he hopes, find inconsistencies in those policies. But, of course, the opposition parties say, well, they're only too glad to have a long campaign and a good chance to put over their case. Are they going to go at it hammer and tongs from the off or 
only from the daily press conferences when they start and when the manifestos are produced? Well, I think one sniff of the electoral water hole and they all join the stampede, Peter. Uh, they can't really help it. Uh, I think what we'll see is a gradual stepping up of the electoral tempo. While the House of Commons is sitting this week, there'll be some campaigning. Next week, uh, after the House has got up, well, they'll be free to campaign quite a lot. And Labour, who were, I think, going to uh, join the Tories in probably launching their election manifesto after Easter, are now seriously thinking of launching it before Easter instead. But we won't really see the fully-fledged election campaign going until after Easter. That's when the daily election press conferences by the parties will start and when the leaders will take to their battle buses and tour the country. What sort of a blow has it been to the Conservatives that the sun has come out for Tony Blair tonight? Oh, there's a lot of dismay in Tory ranks uh, about that. Uh, both major parties spend so much of their time and their energy really cultivating the tabloids. They do see them as being important in swinging public opinion, although there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that the editorial line taken by papers is necessarily reflected in their readers' uh, behaviour at the ballot box. Some Tories are saying, like uh, the cheerleader Lord Archer, that uh, the sun will swing back before, the, before May the 1st. But Others are pretty depressed by this, though I think uh, the Tory High Command are taking uh, some solace from the fact that the Sun came out against Mr Major in the Tory leadership contest, and of course he still won that. Robin Oakley, thank you. Newsnight is on BBC Two at 10.30, in which, as you heard earlier, Tony Blair is interviewed by Jeremy Paxman. <coughs> but that's all from the 9 o'clock news. Excuse me. Good night. <laughs>